one can say that uh, colonization or colonialism is a child of slavery, a child in the sense that the enslaver makes you into an object. An enslaver dehumanizes you. An enslaver sees you as a chattel. An enslaver does not treat you as, an, as a human being. Conversely, colonialism, which is a refinement of slavery, pretends that it is different. It is different to the extent that external control is imposed. But still, you are under control and you are considered to be inferior. And you can see this, uh, that while slavery entailed dealing in human beings as commodities, in the same way that you deal with sugar cane, in the same way that you deal with cattle, in the same way that you deal with any other commodity. Colonization pretends, as I've already indicated, that what we are doing is to create an administration, and that administration even allows the persons who are colonized to work in a system, and sometimes they are even given some kind of payment. So you are elevated to a slightly better position, but you are still considered an inferior human being. You see, in all those situations where slavery had given way to colonization, first of all, what they did is to say, we stop slave trade, we stop slavery, but your land now becomes our colony or becomes our protectorate and we bring in our administrators and we'll use some of you for purposes of enforcing our laws and using your land for our benefit and using your mineral resources and using your human resources. So they are very close cousins, slavery and colonization. There are those who think that there was a transition which was smooth, but all this was planned and carefully choreographed. And it's also important to note that slavery quite never ended. What ended was the classical, traditional slavery where you acknowledge that there's slavery, it is accepted as being legal, where the trade in human beings is also legitimate and the human being is commodified. But no sooner had slavery in its classical sense and slave trade in its crude sense been stopped, then it, in a manner of speaking, segued, moved smoothly into a different model. And that model is what we call colonization. So that when the European powers are meeting in Berlin in 1885 to 1884, 1884 to 1885, they are saying, yes, we have stopped the crude things that we were doing, but we now want to go into a different phase, a different phase where we are administering. So the French are administering in their newfound territories, the British are doing the same, the Italians are doing the same, the Germans are doing the same, the Italians are doing the same, the Dutch are doing the same, and all these in an attempt to continue what they were doing, to use labor in situ where they are, so that labor is no longer being exported to the Caribbean, labor is no longer being exported to Europe, labor is no longer being exported to the United States. Now you are being dominated where you are. If you are in a territory that is now called Kenya or the Democratic Republic of Congo or Congo, then or in Southwest Africa, in Namibia, or in Rhodesia, we are no longer taking you to work in our farms. You are now working our farms locally. And what are we producing? We are producing the very same things for which we exported you to work. We are now producing sugar cane locally. We are producing sisal locally to feed our textile industries. We are producing our coffee locally to feed our pilots. We are producing tea, and this is regulated. The laws have now been brought to your domestic arena in Africa, and we are using that for the purposes of controlling you. So it's very well choreographed, very smooth, 
for the benefit of those individuals. And within the ranks of Africans, they find collaborators wherever they go, whether it's in Tanganyika, whether it is in Kenya, where they have their collaborators or the home guards when rebellion starts with the, the Mau Mau. But it must always be remembered that Africans were resisting. Some Africans were resisting, and that is how you find the wars that were fought by, by the Ashanti and by the Yoruba or the Hehe Rebellion or the Nandi Rebellion or the Zulu Wars or the Mau Mau in Kenya and in different places. So when you talk about smooth, it's only smooth from the perspective of the ones who are implementing, but there was resistance in almost all territories, whether in Angola or in Congo or all those other places, they were always Africans who were resisting, but they were also fifth colonists who were collaborating with the colonizers or the enslavers turned colonizers. The struggle, when we talk about slavery and we talk about colonization, it must always be remembered that the appetite for enslaved peoples or colonized peoples to regain their independence never quite died at all critical moments. And we may focus on Africa, but we must also remember that this was happening in Latin America, happening in Central America, happening in the Caribbean, happening in, uh, in different parts of the world. So that as early as 1821, in, in, in the Caribbean, rather in the Central America, all the countries are granted their independence. And you see that is very early on. Countries such as uh, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Panama are regaining their independence that early. In the Caribbean, it comes a little later in a number of countries. In Latin America, of course, it comes a little early. But the Afri Africa remains the last outpost in, in terms of Africa and Asia. And you see, there are many struggles in Asia. For example, we know what happened with the, the Indian and the activities of individuals such as Mahatma Gandhi, India regaining independence in late 1940s. But even before one comes to Africa, one must also appreciate the very early efforts at gaining freedom by individuals such as Marcus Garvey. In the late 19th century, Marcus Garvey is already calling for a return of people from Caribbean to go back uh, to the African continent. It is also to be remembered that the Americans at that time under their president Monroe creates a colony of freed Africans and that is how Liberia becomes what it is in the late 19th century, complete with a capital named after Monroe, Monrovia. And they settle people there, but they settle them in a manner that they create conflict between the returnees, people who are called americo liberians and the indigenous peoples. Ethiopia, of course, is never successfully colonized. And we remember the fights between Menelik and the Italians, and Ethiopia is in totally a different space. So that when we talk of an African country that was never completely dominated, then it is Ethiopia. But the struggle for independence starts very early. People don't remember in places such as Kenya as early as the 1900s, in the early 1900s, there are individuals who are already saying, we want independence. And that is evident even in Ghana, evident in the Democratic Republic of Congo, evident in Southern Africa. Southern Africa, which is dominated in a very unique way through, 19, uh, through the apartheid regime starting in 1948, it must be remembered that as early as 1912, a political party has already been formed. The African National Congress is formed in 1912. And as early as 1906, one of the founders of the African National Congress, Pixley Kaisa Kaseme, is already delivering a lecture at Columbia University about the regeneration of Africa. So there are different streams of struggle for independence. And the impetus for independence actually gains traction 
after the end of the Second World War. After the end of the Second World War, the world convenes a meeting in San Francisco in the United States of America at which the United Nations Organization is formed. And the charter of the United Nations subsequently leads to the delegitimization of colonization. The European powers are fought and are weak. Britain is weak, Germany is weak, France is weak, Netherlands is weak, Italy is weak, Spain is weak, Portugal is weak, America is the new kid on the block, and of course the Soviet Union, which then emerges. But these were not colonizers. So they are able to come out and say that decolonization must be delegitimized. So the San Francisco Charter of the United Nations in 1945, 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in Paris, France, and we can now see a new wave of the demand for independence. And in 1945, one of the biggest Pan-African uh, uh, Congress meetings is convened in Manchester in the United Kingdom, 1945. And you see some of the leading lights who later participate very intimately in the struggle for independence are present there. Kwame Nkrumah is there. Jomo Kenyatta is there. Obafemi Awolowo from Nigeria is there. And therefore, you begin to see that stream of the struggle for independence. And the first country in, uh, to be recognized as independence is in 1956 in Sudan. That is when the Egyptian, the Anglo-Egyptian uh, Confederation is then dissolved and Sudan becomes independent. But in sub-Saharan Africa, it is Ghana on the sixth day of March 1957 that is the first sub-Saharan African country to regain our independence. But Nkrumah is not satisfied. And in fact, on the day that he uh, gives a speech in Accra, Ghana, he says that the independence of Ghana means nothing if Africa is not free. And it is instructive that immediately after 1957, he convenes a meeting in 1958 in Accra, Ghana, then convenes another meeting in 1960 in Casablanca, Morocco. And by the time that the African Union is being hosted in Addis Ababa by Hale Selassie between the 23rd and 25th days of May 1963, there are 32 African countries that have now regained independence. There has been an explosion of independence in the 1960s. Cote d'Ivoire is independent, Senegal is independent, Mali is independent, the Democratic Republic of Congo is independent, Tanzania is independent, Kenya is independent, Uganda is independence later in the 1960s, of course, Zambia and Nyasaland, the split between Malawi and Zambia comes, and we see that wave of independence. The remnants at that time remain uh, the Portuguese colonies, Angola, Mozambique, Cabo Verde, Guinea-Bissau, and of course, the territories which had been ceded to South African Union, that is South Africa itself, and southwestern Africa, which we now know as Namibia, remain under the control of the apartheid regime. The apartheid regime in its institutionalized form is created in 1948 by the Nationalist Party of Hendrik Fafut. So you can see that there is the wave, and the wave is particularly evident in the 1960s. Ultimately, of course, the Portuguese are unique in this regard because Portugal itself is in trouble, is under a dictatorship. And in the government of Marcelo Caetano in Portugal, until it is overthrown in 1974, I think, by the army of an individual called Antonio de Spinola, that you now begin to see them uh, leaving their former colonies to gain independence with Angola gaining independence, then of course Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, and Cabo Verde. That is the space in which Africa finds herself in terms of regaining what now I call flag independence and, uh, and, 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 and pepper independence in certain cases because we now know better 
that the immediately that the colonial project has ended, another project is introduced, the neo-colonial project. And Kwame Nkrumah writes a book about it. He talks about neo-colonialism, the last stage of imperialism, and he calls it the most dangerous stage. When I'm talking about the fate of the post-colonial African state, I always remember what happened in Addis Ababa in 1963. And I always remember the speeches, particularly of Kwame Nkrumah, Hail Selassie, and Julius Kambaragi Nyerere, and Gamal Abdel Nasser. Nkrumah is so passionate because he, he can telegraph into the future and he tells his audience, let us not leave here, here to me in Addis Ababa, before we agree to cede our sovereignty to create a united Africa. Let us leave here having charged our ministers for foreign affairs to look into the possibility of one army, one currency, one central bank. Let us leave here united. And Krumah goes ahead to say, I am prepared to play another role, not that of a president of that new unit created as Africa. And he says, I even am suggesting the capital of Africa. I know that others may add, have other suggestions, but I am suggesting that Bangui in Central Africa be that capital, is the most central. Of course, nobody listens to him. What we don't remember that at that time, two groups have emerged in Africa. There is what is called the Monrovia group, which says Africa should not unite immediately, it should be slowly and gradual. And then there is the group called the Casablanca group, which says Africa should unite now. Ultimately, what we have is the organization of African unity, which was the victory of the Monrovia group. And why Nkrumah was saying we unite now, is because he feared that the colonialists would come in a different form. And he says, the colonialist does not change. He may wear different masks, but he's the very same. His DNA remains the same. And no sooner have countries regained independence that we begin to see the colonialists coming in different guises. But now they use other Africans, fifth columnists, and you see that with the problems that Patrice Emery Lumumba gets into barely nine months after Congo regains independence, they are using his own confidants, Mobutu Seseseko, Joseph Kasavubu, Moise Chombe, 1961. And he's assassinated in 1961, nine months after Congo regained it, and the Belgians are in control. The same thing happens in Togo. Silvanus Olympio is assassinated. The colonialists, the French are doing it. Modibo Keita in Mali is also removed. Ahmed Ben Bella in Algeria is removed. And in 1966, we see Kwame Nkrumah himself is overthrown while he's in Hanoi in Vietnam. A year later, in Nigeria, we see the removal of the administration of Namdi Azikiwe and the murder of his prime minister, Abubakar Tafawa Balewa, and one of the strongest northern politicians in Nigeria, uh, who is uh, Sir Ahmad Dubello. And you can see the process. It's all choreographed from the erstwhile colonizers. In East Africa, they don't succeed in those early days, but what you see is that 
they organize mutinies in the army. There is a mutiny in Tanganyika. There is a mutiny in, 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 in Kenya. There is a mutiny in Uganda. And ultimately, the government of Apollo Milton Obote is overthrown in 1971. So the colonial, the neo-colonial project started immediately. So that if one were to, 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 to use what, why, the metamorphosis, using a metamorphosis, that there was a metamorphosis of slavery into colonization, which then metamorphosed into neocolonialism. And what we see presently is neocolonialism at its worst. Because Africans are now beginning to realize, Africans of goodwill, that we were shortchanged, that we got the shorthand of the stick, that we got the crown without the jewels, that we got an animal that had been disemboweled. And that is the stage at which Africa finds herself, the neo-colonial stage, which is the last stage of imperialism and the most dangerous because the, the enslaver turned colonizer, turned neo-colonizer, now recognizes that the game is up and that their goose is about to be cooked and they are not just about to leave. They are going to leave wailing and kicking and it's going to be bloody. South Africa is unique. When Jan van Riebeck arrived in what is known as the Cape of Good Hope in 1688 or thereabouts, they did not intend to leave. They came to settle. And they were aggressive, the Boers, from what is now the Netherlands. And when they came in, they decimated the population, the Khoisan or the San people in that area, in the, what is in the Cape area. And after they had come, there was, the English also came. And there were many wars, the Anglo-Boer War. And then, of course, they also were confronting Africans, the activities of Chaka, the Zulu, and uh, the, the Mfetane, when the Zulu kingdom was now expanding. And then they, of course, had to confront both the Boers and the, and, and the English at that time. So that the South African came to settle and almost, not almost, but claimed that, that these are new lands where nobody belonged. And they came, and you can see when you travel and you go to South Africa, they named every other place after their ancestors or places in their own part of the world, whether it's Kostrad or Kimberley, or which may be British, but uh, they, they went into Johannesburg and all these places. So they never came, they never wanted to leave. And when South Africa was then handed over by the League of Nations, I think, and then to the territory and to the government, and the whites had settled in the manner that they did, then they instituted a system of government which was hitherto unknown in the entire world. Completely unknown. Based on discrimination. Based on color. The nationalist government of the Boer called Hendrik Farfoot in 1948 said that the administration of South Africa will be based on one skin color with the whites at the apex. The Indians or persons of that nature came second. Then later, after they had built a crop of people through intermarriage, the coloreds, then the blacks. And this was institutionalized, apartheid was institutionalized so that schools were separated, hostels were separated, places were separated. And that was from 1948. And the agitation had started much earlier. As I've said, the Africans were already organizing as early as 1912. But the, what we are familiar with is, is a lot later. 
when we now see some of the stalwarts of the movement uh, being uh, arrested, but we don't talk about, uh, or, or even if we do, we don't talk as much as we should of people such as Pixley Kaisa Kaseme, who were at the forefront of the creation of the African uh, National Congress. We don't talk about Chief Albert Lutuli. We don't talk about Governor Mbeki. We, we don't talk about them. So we begin to see Africa and South Africa when we begin to see the activities of people like Walter Sisulu in the 1950s, 1960s, when we begin to see individuals such as Nelson Mandela, when we begin to see individuals such as Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe in the 1960s. That is when apartheid is now at its worst and is being supported by Western powers. The United Kingdom is supporting them. The United States of America is supporting them. They, of course, the Europeans are supporting them. Israel is supporting the apartheid regime. And we begin to see the punishment and the arrest of all these individuals, and they are being taken to Robben uh, Island. And the much more iconic of the trials is the Rivonia trials at which we see individuals who are in the forefront, such as Nelson Mandela and, of course, Governor Mbeki and, and Sisulu and others, being uh, taken ultimately uh, to Robben Islands. Of course, uh, uh, there have been activities at resistance, such as the Sharpville massacre in 1960s, and all these happens. It is unique. The only other thing that you can see that is uh, comparable to it is the regime in Rhodesia, which is being run by Ian Smith and being underwritten by the government of the United Kingdom. So apartheid is declared a crime against humanity because in modern history, even when there was discrimination, it was not institutionalized in the manner that it was in South Africa. And the world really is... Is, is riled by it, and the people are riled by it. And, and that is why we think and, and believe and know that apartheid was pernicious. It was man's inhumanity to man in a manner that had never been seen in modern times until its collapse, of course, in 1990s. People, the colonizers always want us to say that they built roads, that they brought about education, and they say all those things. But I always tell them, what is the value of poison that is sugar-coated? Ultimately, it is poison. So I'm one who is quick to say that we must look at the real picture and the real picture is that colonization may have done certain things or through during the period of colonization, education and other things, but in the ultimate, it robbed the colonized people of the most important thing that God created us to be, that is self-esteem. It killed our souls and numbed our brains. So I'm not one who is going to say that because of external things, therefore, all that glitters is gold. All that glitters is not gold. Lumumale.